the last lecture we presented Aristotelian theory of syllogism, in that uh, uh, we have presented what we mean by a categorical syllogism. A categorical syllogism is a specific kind of argument which is considered to be a deductive argument in a sense that conclusion necessarily follows from the premises and uh, these categorical syllogisms are formed in some certain way that all the premises all the propositions that uh, we commonly see in the categorical prep categorical syllogisms are considered to be categorical propositions. So, what are categorical propositions A, E, I and O are considered to be the categorical propositions. A stands for uh, all men are mortal for example, uh, I proposition stands for some men are mortal and O proposition stands for some men are not mortal and uh, E proposition stands for no men are mortal. So, depending upon the quantity and quality Aristotle has classified uh, these categorical propositions into four different categories and then in a given syllogism at least two categorical propositions uh, will, will be there which will serve as premises and the other one will serve as a conclusion. So, which is also considered to be a categorical proposition. So, what, what we are basically discussing is this that how two categorical proposition leads to another one which constitutes the problem of validity of syllogisms. In this class what we will be doing is we will be studying in detail. Uh, the validity of syllogisms using Aristotelian theory of logics uh, and then we will talk about some of the rules of inferences, some of the rules which validates these syllogisms and then we will move on to the reduction of syllogisms and then we will talk about some important operations which will help us in making some kind of immediate inferences. So, then at the end we will talk about the limitations of Aristotelian logics. So, to begin with uh, uh, in the last class we discussed in detail how Aristotle classified uh, various uh, syllogisms into different kinds of figures. So, it, this can be explained uh, like this. So, based on how the middle term is distributed Aristotle has classified uh, various kinds of syllogisms into four different figures and all. So, in the first figure the middle term occupies the position of a subject and in the second premise of uh, figure number 1 the middle term occupies the position of a predicate whereas in figure number 2 uh, uh, it occupies the position of predicates in both the things both the premises in the in figure number 3 uh, the middle term occupies the position of a subject and in figure number 4 in the first premise uh, the middle term occupies the position of a predicate of a sentence and it occupies the position of a subject in the second premise of figure number 4. So, according to Aristotle figure number 3 and figure number 4 are considered to be imperfect kind of uh, figures or moods and all. So, the moods that occur in figure number 3 figure number 4 are considered to be imperfect uh, moods imperfect figures and these figures can be reduced to uh, either figure number 1 or figure number 2. We will be seeing how the moods that occur in figure number 3 and figure number 4 can be reduced to figure number 1 which is considered to be the standard kind of figure perfect kind of uh, figure according to Aristotle. So, why he has uh, why, why he is of the view that figure number 1 the moods that fall under figure number 1. First of all what we mean by mood is like this that any triplet like A A A A E E A I etcetera all these things constitutes uh, mood of an argument and then uh, corresponding to the mood we have a figure then it is simply represented as for example, if I say A A A 1 means uh, is a mode which occurs in figure number 1. For example, if I say A A A 2 then it occurs in figure number 2. Uh, in the mode first two letters stands for the premises and the third one stands for the conclusion. So, this is what uh, we have depending upon how the middle term is uh, uh, distributed we have four different kinds of figures and then uh, there are four kinds of categorical statements which we have A, E, I and O and any, any syllogism we have only three categorical statements. So, therefore, we have 64 moods possible in each and every figure. So, 4 to the power of 3 that means 64 possible moods like A, 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 E, A, E, I, 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 I all these things will constitute different kinds of mode depending upon how the middle term is distributed. 
So, here the middle term takes the position of a subject in the first premise and middle term takes the position of a predicate in the second premise in figure number 1. So, each and every figure has 64 different modes and uh, that means we have 4 into 4 into 64 that means we have 256 syllogisms possible uh, if you construct uh, this thing in this way. So, out of this 256 uh, syllogisms uh, according to Aristotle. Uh, 15 are considered to be uh, unconditionally uh, 15 are considered to be unconditionally valid and, and 9 are considered to be uh, conditionally valid. So, so in the first figure these are the syllogisms which are moods which are considered to be valid and all A A A and it has its own letters and all uh, they named it with uh, some kind of Latin names and all but the name Barbara suggests that we have to look at the vowels and all and even the consonants also convey some kind of information here we will talk about this thing in greater detail when I analyze this uh, syllogistic poem which we will be talking about little bit later. So in Barbara the vowels that occur are A A A that means uh, the first two proposition categorical propositions are A propositions and the conclusion is also an A proposition E A E in the same way uh, it has its own name Silarent you have to observe the uh, ovals that occur in this uh, Latin word silarent. Uh, the first letter, first vowel which you come across after C is E, and then after L you will find, after the consonant L you will find A, and after R you will find E and all. So that means uh, E A E is considered to be uh, the mood of uh, this particular kind of thing, and Aristotle could come up with uh, these uh, unconditionally, he could come up with the view that only these kinds of syllogisms are unconditionally valid, but how do we know that these are uh, what do we mean by saying that they are unconditionally valid there are no specific external conditions which are imposed on this one. So, which also happens to be true in the case of modern logic as well. So, later Boole has worked extensively on Aristotelian theory of syllogisms which constitutes the modern logic. So, there uh, you know you, you will see that all these syllogisms that are listed under the category of unconditionally valid syllogisms are going to be valid even in modern logic as well. But there are some uh, conditionally valid syllogisms which depends upon whether or not the terms there are uh, Aristotelian theory Aristotelian logics are also called as term logics what are important in Aristotelian logic the basic units are terms subject and middle and uh, predicate terms uh, middle term major term and the minor term. So, these are considered to be the three terms which are important in deciding whether a given syllogism is valid or not. So, in Aristotelian theory by default it is it is taken for granted that all the terms are non empty. So, that means uh, there is no way in which you will consider an empty set and these sets corresponds to these terms and all which they refer to. Suppose if you say set of tigers and all it is considered to be a non empty kind of set. So, what happens if you take into consideration there are many things which we talk about empty sets and all for example uh, you can still one can still reason about world war 3 and then we can talk about how to uh, prevent that world war 3 etc which does not exist at this moment which is considered to be an empty set you can still reason about those things you know. So, in the same way what happens when you have unicorns or dinosaurs or something like that which are considered to be a, a, an empty set and all. So, it sets some kind of limitation to Aristotelian logic, but Aristotle uh, according to Aristotle there are certain syllogisms which are considered to be valid based on whether or not the, the whatever term that occupies the subject position actually exists or in the other case whatever occupies the middle term whether that actually exists in the world etcetera and all based on that uh, he made some other syllogisms valid. And all. So, in total there are 24 syllogisms out of 256 syllogisms which are considered to be valid syllogisms according to Aristotle. So, here is a, a poem uh, with which uh, they could remember what kind of syllogisms are valid with respect to what kind of figure and all. Uh, it, it, uh, this uh, mnemonic poem uh, which is also called as a syllogistic poem first appeared first appearance is like this and then it has let later been changed to uh, the second part of uh, this slide that is Barbara, Silarent, Dari, Firio, Q. Prioris means it is going to be the first figure, 
and then the second one Cesare, Chemistre, Festino, Boracco, Seconda means second figure and then there is something which uh, this word refers to Tertia, Grandi, Sunas, Recita, etc and all. So the, uh, the idea here is, is that uh, anyone who mucks up this uh, particular kind of poem they can come to know um, what kind of syllogisms are considered to be valid and all. So this is a kind of a coded uh, kind of language and all in which uh, for example if you take any particular Latin word and all let us say Barbara and all in that oval stands for the moods of a syllogism A A A for example and then the consonants also have some meaning and all. So in the first figure we do not find uh, any such kind of thing because they are considered to be perfect moods and all. So whereas in the case of uh, starting from the second figure onwards that means Cesare, chemistry, etc and all. Suppose if you observe Cesare uh, C E S A R E, uh, E stands for a vowel that means uh, it is a E A E preposition and immediately after E we have a consonant S. S stands for some kind of uh, unique kind of code and all which I will talk about a little bit later. It stands for simple conversion uh, etc and all. So consonants also expresses some kind of thing and all other letters uh, that are used in some kind of aesthetic sense and all. So when I analyze this poem and all when I talk about reduction of syllogisms I will go into the details of uh, this syllogistic poem in greater detail. So now so far we have said that out of 256 syllogisms uh, 15 are unconditionally valid and 9 are considered to be conditionally valid. So how do we know that uh, these 15 syllogisms are unconditionally valid. So Aristotle has come up with uh, some rules for the valid syllogisms after all logic is all about the study of principles of valid reasoning. So there are some kind of rules for these valid syllogisms and the rules are like this. So the first rule is, is that the middle term of a valid syllogism if it is a valid syllogism then the middle term that occurs in a syllogism has to be distributed at least once in the premises. If it is not distributed at least once in the premises then it is considered to be an invalid kind of uh, syllogism. So, so we need to know about something about what we mean by distribution and all. A term is distributed especially when, when it is referring to uh, the whole class that it, it refers to and all. So uh, we talked about uh, this distribution in greater detail in the last few classes but if you want to remember uh, using a mnemonic and all then there is a mnemonic which is widely used in most of the logic textbooks that is uh, like this any student earning B's is not on probation. So this is uh, like uh, this is the one which we need to uh, remember if you can remember this one we will come to know what term is distributed etc and all in what kind of categorical preposition any student earning B's he got all B's and all is not on academic probation that is simply write it as this thing. So what does this sentence convey and all? So now we need to look for the first letters of this particular kind of sentence. This is considered to be a, a preposition, a preposition distributes subject the next one which is immediately there here and the first letter in this one this word is E, E preposition distributes both that means subject and subject and predicate. So this is distribution. This is the theory of Aristotle, uh, Aristotle has come up with this view that in A preposition only subject term is distributed whereas in E preposition uh, S and P are distributed and in the case of uh, uh, I preposition that is the case here in the third this is the word which we have N stands for neither of them that means this is the one neither subject nor predicated. So none of the terms are distributed in this uh, preposition and the last one is uh, O preposition and uh, in O preposition this is the one which we have is not on probation this is on probation O preposition distributes only predicated. 
So this is the one which we need to remember and then there are other ways to uh, uh, know about this one uh, if you can draw Venn diagrams or if you can draw Euler diagrams then also you will come to know which term is distributed etc. So the first thing which you need to know is which term is distributed etc. So now uh, the second rule says that if any term in the conclusion of a valid syllogism is distributed that term has to be distributed in the premises now that means nothing is distributed in the conclusion which is not distributed earlier in the premises now uh, if that is the case then uh, if it is distributed in the conclusion but not distributed in the premises and all then the syllogism is considered to be valid invalid. So in the same way in any valid syllogism uh, has at least one positive and one negative premise then its conclusion will always be negative and all you have one affirmative proposition let us say a proposition is there and then you have a negative proposition let us say e or o then the conclusion has to be uh, with either e or o and all it cannot be an affirmative kind of proposition the, the affirmative propositions are a and i propositions are considered to be affirmative and e and o are considered to be negative propositions. So this is one of the rules which uh, uh, which makes some syllogisms valid and all. And the fourth rule states that no syllogism is valid if it has two negative premises and all. So that means uh, if a categorical syllogism has two negative prem premises and all that means what are the negative premises E and O are considered to be negative premises. Suppose if you have E E and then you infer A and all first of all if you have two negative premises you cannot infer anything and all. So this is a very important thing important observation is this that uh, if in order for a syllogism to be valid at least one affirmative proposition should be there you know. So in the premises so that is the fourth rule if two negative premises no inference can be possible and the final one is if any valid syllogism has only universal premises that means a a kind of thing and its conclusion also should be universal you know. But it is only in the case of Aristotelian logics if there are two universal propositions as premises the conclusion can still be uh, particular kind of proposition and all. So that makes these nine uh, propositions categorical syllogisms conditionally valid. So we will be seeing with uh, some examples of course we will uh, we'll talk more some, something more about these rules of syllogisms based on the observations that uh, we have. So when Aristotle has proposed this particular kind of theory then it has these particular kinds of things. So there are only three terms in a syllogism. So you might say if there are more than four terms and all what needs to be done and all. So it has to be reduced to only three terms and all. For example if you say all X are y, uh, all A's are B's all B's are D all B's are C's all C's are D's etc. That means A B C D there are four terms in that one. So in that case what we need to do is we need to reduce two categorical proportion to another one. Let us say all A's are B's all B's are C's that is reduced to all A's are C's and all. So now the next proposition is all C's are D's that means all A's are D's but it is not as simple as the one which I am trying to uh, express and all in uh, in actual practice it, it may not be the case and all. So this again sets some kind of serious limitations to Aristotelian logics if uh, there are more than three terms and all then things will become uh, it, it becomes difficult to express in this uh, simple theory of uh, formal theory of syllogisms now which talks about the validity of syllogisms. So the second rule is is that the middle term is not in the conclusion and all so middle term never occurs in the conclusion middle term occurs only in the premises by chance if the middle term occurs in the conclusion then there is something wrong with uh, the arrangement of uh, the propositions and all it is not considered to be uh, it is not permitted actually first of all. Uh, to be treated as valid or invalid. So the third rule is that the quantity of a term cannot become greater than uh, greater in the conclusion and all. So uh, if there are two uh, A propositions and all it cannot be E proposition and all the conclusion cannot be an E proposition. So for example if you have two particular kind of propositions and all I propositions it cannot be an universal proposition in the conclusion and all. So 
the, uh, the quantity of a term cannot become greater in the case of conclusion and all. So in that sense you know Aristotle permits uh, or from two A propositions you can still infer an I proposition there the quantity of the uh, terms that, that occurs in the conclusion is not greater in the uh, in the conclusion and all when compared to the premises and all. So this rule needs to be uh, uh, explained in, uh, in greater detail but it is not that important at this moment. So the, uh, the fourth rule is, is that these are all some observations uh, from the rules that we have already presented uh, in the last slide. So the middle term must be distributed at least once in the premises and all. So that is what we have stated already if it is not distributed at least once then the syllogism is considered to be invalid and all. For example if you take two particular kind of propositions and all uh, some dogs are animals or some animals are wise or intelligent something suppose if you say like that from the two particular premises you cannot infer anything and all. So because of this that uh, in the I proposition it, uh, none of the terms are distributed and all I proposition distributes neither of them. So, uh, so what we what is important here is, is that in a syllogism middle in especially when you take middle term into consideration it has to be distributed at least once in the premises and all. So that means the middle term has to be either A, E, R, O kind of proposition and all where at least the terms are distributed and all at least once ok. So the uh, another rule is this that there are general observations and all the fifth rule is, is that at least one premise must be affirmative and all what are the affirmative propositions uh, categorical propositions A and I are affirmative categorical propositions and all. So now this observation we can see this one clearly now you see this unconditionally valid kind of syllogisms and all in the first figure we have A, A, A in that at least one affirmative proposition is already there A proposition is an affirmative proposition. So in the same way E A E again A is an affirmative kind of proposition and in the third one A I I there is one A is there even I is also an affirmative kind of proposition E I O again I is an uh, affirmative proposition also in this way in all the unconditionally valid or even the conditionally valid syllogisms at least one affirmative proposition should be there in the premises and all in the same way E I O I proposition is considered to be an affirmative kind of proposition. So even in the third figure uh, for example if you see Bocardo that is O A I so A proposition is considered to be an affirmative proposition. So in all the syllogisms if you do not have at least one affirmative proposition you cannot infer anything that is what we have been saying for example if you have two negative propositions uh, E E proposition you cannot infer anything no cats are dogs no dogs are donkeys. So if you infer something else like no cats are uh, donkeys etc and all even if you your conclusion is correct and all but you cannot infer anything in the sense that two negative premises you cannot infer anything. So this is the uh, uh, fifth rule at least one affirmative proposition should be there in that uh, syllogism if it has to be valid. The sixth rule is, is that if one premise is negative the conclusion will automatically be a negative proposition. So if the conclusion is negative the vice versa is also applies here if the conclusion is negative then at least one of the premises should be negative and all. So then only um, so if the conclusion is negative the premise also should be negative and all if it is not the case then uh, the syllogism is considered to be invalid. If both premises are affirmative the conclusion also should be affirmative and all suppose if you have A A proposition I I proposition is ruled out because you cannot infer anything because the middle term is not distributed in that particular kind of uh, propositions and all. So if you have A A proposition you cannot infer E proposition and all so in the same way if you have uh, I uh, in the same way A A proposition is there you cannot infer uh, O proposition or E proposition and all. So the eighth rule eighth rule states that at least one premise must be universal and all. So this is another interesting observation which we can make out. So at least one of the premises must be having some kind of uh, it's, it should be an universal proposition. What are the universal propositions? A and E are considered to be uh, a universal proposition. So look at the premises of all the valid syllogisms and all then you will find this that 
at least I mean all the valid syllogisms you will find either A or E in this valid syllogisms now. So that is another interesting and important observation and the ninth rule states that if one premise is particular then the conclusion is also particular and all. So for example if it becomes with all X or Y and some Y or Z and all then the conclusion also should be particular and all. In extension logic that means the modern logics after Boole if both premises are universal then the conclusion should also be universal and all it cannot be particular it cannot be particular in the sense that if it becomes particular then we are importing existence into the conclusion which is not there in the premises and all. suppose if I say that all cats are dogs and all that does not mean that you know the cats and dogs have to be exist to say that it is true and it can be assumed to be true also as well it need not be the case that all cats and dogs should actually be true and all and the cats exist dog ex, dogs exist etc. But if you say some cats are dogs and all that means it talks about the existence of cats which are considered to be dogs and all. So uh, that means dogs actually exist and all. So we are importing existence which is not there in the premises in the conclusion that leads to uh, according to the modern logics or extensional logics which is called as an existential fallacy which we will talk about it little bit later again it sets limitation to Aristotelian logics and all. So this is considered to be kind of fallacy especially when you infer from two universal propositions you infer a particular proposition then that is considered to be a, an existential fallacy in modern logics okay. So suppose if you if you do not if our rules does not satisfy and all then obviously there are mistakes in the argumentation that is the one which we have considered in the case of formal fallacies they are considered to be fallacies and all. So these are some of the fallacies that we have if the rules are not the rules are violated and all. Suppose if we have it is the first rule is pretty straightforward and all and it is also taken for granted that there is no equivocation in the present in the argument and all that means there should be exactly three terms and these terms should be used in the same sense and all they should not be used in two different senses and all. For example if you say all uh, this room is made up of atoms atoms are invisible and this room is invisible and atoms are used in, in the premises in two different ways and all the first premise it is used in some some sense in the second premise atoms are invisible in that it is atoms are used in a different sense. So this is what is equivocation fallacy it has uh, all the terms should be used in, uh, in the same sense and all and there is no shift in the meaning of the words that you have used in the premises and all there is shift in the meaning of the usage of these words in the premises then there is something wrong with this argument that is equivocation fallacy. So middle term must be distributed at least once in the premises that is what we have said in the rules and all if it is not distributed then it is called as fallacy of undistributed middle and in any syllogism we have major term minor term and middle term and all. Suppose if it is a case that no term can be distributed in the conclusion which is not distributed in the premises that is what we have said in the rules suppose it is, distrib it is distributed in the conclusion but it is not distributed in the premises and all. So depending upon what is a major premise or minor premise etc and all so this rule is violated with respect to a major premise it is called as illicit major when its rule is violated with respect to the minor premise minor premise is the one in which where you will find the minor term major premise is a premise in which you will find the major term. So major term is considered to be the predicate of the conclusion and minor term is considered to be the subject of a conclusion in a syllogism. So wherever the subject term of a conclusion occurs in the premises that is considered to be a minor premise and wherever the major term occurs that is the, that is the predicate of the conclusion that is considered to be the major term and all. So when the problem lies with the major term or minor term is the one which we need to look for where this undistribution is taking place that is the not this uh, that is the that is where this kind of fallacy arises. So the fourth fallacy is fallacy of exclusive premises that means if you have two negative premises nothing can be inferred in the same way if you have two particular premises nothing can be inferred and the fifth one affirmative conclusion from negative premises is not allowed 
and either premise is negative then the conclusion also has to be negative and all. If the conclusion is negative and the premises are one of the premises also have to be negative and all. So this is the fallacy which I, I talked about in the last slide it is no particular conclusion from the universal premises. If you have two universal premises or categorical propositions you cannot infer a particular categorical proposition. But for Aristotle depending upon whether or not uh, the term which occupies the position of a subject uh, term occupies the position of a predicate or the middle term they actually exist in the world and all if it is non empty and all then there is no problem uh, for the validity of a syllogism it makes it conditionally valid and all. For example unicorns dinosaurs etc they will not exist and all they do not actually exist and all. So in that case uh, uh, I mean it is it is difficult to say whether uh, Aristotelian theory applies or not. So Aristotelian theory in general it takes into consideration that all terms are non empty and all. So whatever term you take into the syllogism uh, that is that is already taken for granted or by default it is it is referring to it is not referring to any empty class and all. Empty sets are those sets in which you do not have any elements and all for example if you say set of unicorns etc and all then there is no unicorn exist in the world or set of ghosts etc and all it is an empty set. So Aristotelian theory is a little bit silent about this particular kind of thing but uh, Aristotle uh, compromised with this particular kind of thing and he says that he is of the view that depending upon whether or not uh, S, P, M etc actually exist and all it makes this syllogism conditionally valid. So now uh, so far we have seen uh, uh, different rules and all so now we will like to see whether uh, whether these following syllogisms are valid or invalid. So now observe the first uh, uh, syllogism and all and then we will work on one or two examples and then we will move on to some other uh, kind of things that is the reduction of syllogisms and all which we can talk about the immediate inference and all immediate inference are those inference in which from one particular kind of categorical proposition another categorical proposition follows and all. So now let us consider uh, some examples which are there uh, there in all and then we will analyze it in we will analyze this example in greater some fish are tasty and then of course uh, all fish can swim uh, can swim then what is the conclusion here some tasty things some tasty things whatever things that are tasty and all can simply forget about what it means and etc and all. So as long as uh, form is there and all we do not have to worry much about it. So this can be translated into uh, it does not matter whether fish are uh, tasty things or swimming uh, etc all these things whether they exist or not. Now we can translate it into some x or y's where x stands for this thing and y stands for this and then this we fixed x for fish and all it's already there and then swimming is considered to be z and all 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 x are z and this is the form of this one. and then some tasty things some y's are uh, can swim is uh, referred as z. So now we transform this thing into this one it does not matter what we mean by fish donkeys cats it does not matter. So once we transformed it into form and all now we can see whether this argument is valid or not. So now the first thing which you need to know uh, about this one is this particular kind of thing. So what is the uh, this is uh, this is a sentence in which y is considered to be a subject and z is considered to be predicate. In all. The predicate this is the conclusion and these two are premises. In all. So now the predicate of the conclusion is called as a major term. Major term here is z. So now the subject of a conclusion is called as minor term. In all. So this is the minor minor term minor term is uh, this is the minor term y. 
so now whatever term occurs twice in the premises so that is considered to be uh, the middle terminal so this constitutes x is a middle term so this is the first thing which we need to find out before knowing whether this particular kind of syllogism is valid or invalid so now now there are uh, some rules which we need to apply and then um, we need to see whether uh, this particular kind of thing is valid or invalid so these are some of the rules that uh, we will be applying and then we will see whether it, it does not mean that if one of the rules satisfies then the syllogism is valid and all but it has to satisfy all the rules and all it is a conjunction of all these rules and all. So now uh, what is the first thing which you need to see is the distribution of a middle term so what is the middle term here x so now uh, wherever you have x and all the middle term should be distributed at least once in the premises and all. So here it is not distributed and all because it is an i proposition i proposition distributes neither of them neither subject nor predicate it will not distribute and all so we not have to worry, worry much about it but observe this the second statement and all all x are z and all where x is considered to be the middle term so if it is an a proposition it distributes subject and all so what occupies the subject position here is x so uh, so middle term is distributed uh, distribution of middle term in premises so this is the rule number 1 and all so this satisfies now we need to look for uh, other rules and all so the other rule is uh, this that uh, if any term in the conclusion of a valid syllogism is distributed that term has to be distributed in the uh, premises and all so now look at the uh, conclusion and all conclusion is an i proposition i proposition uh, it distributes neither of them and all so nothing is distributed in the conclusion and all so either y is not, y is not distributed even z is also not distributed and all because it is i proposition i proposition distributes neither subject term or not even the predicate term and all. so now we need to see whether this y and z are distributed in the uh, premises and all so since it is an i proposition the first one there is no question of uh, the distribution of uh, the term y and uh, since it is an a proposition a proposition distributes only s and all but not the predicate and all so it is also not distributed and all so the idea here is is that uh, here nothing is distributed in the conclusion which is not distributed in the premises and all here it is not distributed even in the premises also it is not distributed and all so rule number 2 also applies here and then rule number 3 is this that if it has one positive and one negative premise the conclusion has to be negative and all so here you won't find any positive and negative kind of conclusions and all so that rule won't apply and all so that is also follows and all automatically we don't this this rule will not apply on this particular kind of thing and, all. and the fourth rule also is this that no syllogism is valid if it has two negative premises we do not have any negative premises here all are affirmative propositions it is an i proposition it is an a proposition and this is an i proposition so even fourth rule also satisfies and the fifth one if any valid syllogism has two universal premises it does not have any two universal premises in all so it is in this sense more or less all the rules applies in all in this particular kind of thing. Uh, so some of the rules may not uh, even directly apply to this one so we do not have to bother much about it if it applies then we need to see whether that rule is um, uh, followed or not so in, it is in this sense this particular kind of argument is considered to be valid this argument is considered to be a valid kind of argument and all. so now let us consider some more examples one or two examples with which uh, you will come to know whether a particular kind of syllogism is valid or invalid just for the sake of uh, this thing we write something in all some x are 
y sum y star z sum these are pretty simple things and all so now uh, the problem with this particular kind of thing you might say that is a straightforward thing and all you can say some cats are animals some animals are uh, animals bark and all so that means some dogs barks and all that might seem to be very sensible for you and all but the problem here is is that uh, uh, according to the theory of syllogisms all are i propositions and all first of all when you have two particular kind of propositions i propositions you cannot infer anything in all. why because again uh, the middle term here is y so middle term has to be distributed at least once in the premises and all so that means it has to be uh, the middle term has to uh, the proposition which consists of middle term should be at least either a proposition or at least e proposition or at least even o proposition and all but it should definitely should not be an i proposition i proposition middle term is not distributed this is a middle term because it occurs twice in this premises and all so this conclusion uh, this uh, categorical syllogism is clearly invalid and all because uh, because of this particular kind of thing middle term is not distributed at least once middle term not distributed at least once in the premises but in, in both the premises it is not distributed and all. So in this sense uh, we can talk about several other kinds of arguments this x and y refer to uh, cats, dogs, donkeys anything you replace it with something then uh, you will see whatever you replace it with then that argument is obviously going to be an invalid kind of argument. Another example for you this thing you take into consideration no x or y all y star z let us for, for the sake of uh, consideration and then 3 is some x or not z. So now this is an e proposition negative proposition and then this is an a proposition according to our uh, rules of syllogism it is clear that even when you have a negative proposition your conclusion also has to be negative enough. So it seems to be the case that you know conclusion is also a negative proposition because so positive propositions are A and I because these are all affirmative it affirms something and all and negative propositions are E and O. So there is a there is a mnemonic that we have used earlier that is affirmo, affirmo and nego. So you observe this. Uh, vowels that occurs in this word a and i that means a and i are affirmative and e and o are considered to be negative and all so this is called as a mnemonic so mnemonic we use and all and the other mnemonic which is quite useful for us is this particular kind of thing okay so now it appears that uh, your uh, premises are at least one of the premises is negative the conclusion is also negative and all a third or fourth rule applies and all. Now we need to see the first thing we need to find out is what is the predicate and what is the subject of your conclusion. So this is considered to be minor term and this is considered to be major term and wherever this z occurs the term z occurs that is a major term that is considered to be a major uh, premise and all this is a major premise and this is called as minor premise because x occurs here whereas z is the predicate of the conclusion because it occurs here it is a major premise and, all. and also the convention is this that we always state this major premise first followed by that you have a minor premise and then you have a conclusion that is the style which is followed in most of the syllogisms and all. So okay, uh, it will be a little bit boring if you are entering into greater analysis of this one which some of the things which I already covered it. So now we need to talk about the distribution of middle term and all whether this rule applies to this one or not. So what is the middle term here y, y is considered to be the middle term here. So the rule says that the middle term should be distributed at least once and all. 
So, in both the cases it is distributed because it is an E proposition, E proposition distributes both of them, both of them means subject and predicate and all, whatever occupies the subject and predicate positions and all, so that is terms and all that is said to be distributed and all, both X is distributed and Y is also said to be distributed. So, I mean this middle term is distributed even at least once is satisfied and all, not only that thing even in the second premise also. Uh, categorical proposition the term y is said to be distributed and all. So, middle term distribution of middle term is uh, having no problem and now the second rule is, is that nothing is distributed in the conclusion which is not distributed in the premises and all. Suppose if it is distributed the term is distributed in the conclusion it has to be distributed at least once in the premises and all. So, now in this case uh, it is an O proposition. O proposition distributes only the term which occurs in the predicate position. So, that means uh, uh, it distributes only Z here. So, Z is distributed here. So, now we need to see whether Z is distributed in this one. So, now in this proposition only Y is said to be distributed and all. And in this proposition, x and y are said to be distributed, but not z and all. So now this is leading to a problem that something is distributed in the conclusion here, that is the term z, but it is not distributed anywhere in the premises and all. Although it occurs here, but in it is an a proposition, a proposition only s is considered to be distributed. So the problem here is is that in conclusion, the word z is the term z is distributed but it is not distributed in the premises and all. So, that means it violates uh, this particular kind of rule uh, that is uh, this one second rule it violates. So, that means this particular kind of argument is invalid. So, like this uh, we can find out uh, whether or not a given syllogism is considered to be valid or not and out of this 256 syllogisms Aristotle could come up with 15 syllogisms which are considered to be conditionally valid and 9 are considered to be conditionally valid and all. So, we will talk about one instance of conditional syllogism and all. So, that is A A I. So, this is like this suppose if you have uh, any argument in which you have this particular kind of thing all x or y all all y are z and then from this you infer some x or z. Uh, this is uh, with respect to figure number 1. In figure number 1 uh, the middle term should be like this m and m. In the first premise the middle term should occupy the subject position and in the second pre uh, proposition categorical proposition the middle term should occupy the position of a predicate. So, now we have to change it a little bit and all uh, this one it is not in the standard format. So, now first you identify the ma uh, major term and the minor term. So, this is the major term z is considered to be the major term and this is considered to be the minor term. So, wherever this z occurs so that needs to be stated first and followed by that we have this particular kind of thing minor premise and all. So, this becomes this thing all all y's are z's then this becomes all x or y z. So, why we have done like this because the, the predicate of the conclusion is a major term major term occurs wherever the major term occurs that is considered to be a major premise and you, have, you should have major premise and followed by that you have minor premise and you should have a conclusion now. So, now it is in this particular kind of format. So, the middle term occupies the position of a subject here because this is considered to be the middle term because it occurs twice in the premises. So, this is exactly the same as this is Barbari instead of Barbara it is Barbari. So, this is A A and I 
proposition. So now for Aristotle this is considered to be uh, kind of valid kind of argument you know, depending upon whether or not uh, the term uh, for example this is going to be valid according to him especially when the subject term that you are uh, referring to that is this one some x. So whatever you are referring to that actually exists in the world now suppose if it is referring to some unicorns some dinosaurs uh, some kind of other things which are non-existing kind of thing ghosts etc and all then Aristotle is silent about those things you know. So it Aristotle's theory of syllogism directly applies to those things in which these things are x, y, z etc and all are considered to be non-empty and all. But in modern logic in particular uh, if this kind of pro problem is there and all for example you can take into consideration uh, some example and all. Uh, uh, all forget about uh, this thing in all all unicorns or dogs forget about whether it is true or false it does not matter you can assume this thing to be true and all all dogs bark let us say it is also again wrong and all but most of the dogs may not bark but they will be bite and all. So from this if you infer that you know, some x are what some dogs some dogs or z z means one second uh, uh, this is not the one which uh, so this is y and uh, this is uh, considered to be z and now some some x uh, one second uh, uh, what is this uh, some some unicorns are dogs let us say y is uh, uh, this thing and z is this one and then uh, some x are y uh, x means it should be some other uh, thing and all. Okay, forget about uh, this particular kind of example we will talk about it a little bit later but the idea here is, is that uh, in modern logic in particular uh, whenever you have all y or z all x or y etc and all from that you infer this particular kind of thing some x or z this presupposes that this uh, some x or z means uh, so let us say so you say that some cats are animals and all there are some cats which are considered to be animals and all that means it leads to some kind of uh, thing which is called as the existence of this particular kind of thing the object that it is referring to the cats or animals or whatever it is dogs donkeys etc uh, which presupposes the existence of these things in the conclusion and all. Suppose if you say all y's are z does not mean that you know that it has to be exist it has to be existent in the uh, actual world and all. But if you say that some dogs are some, some dogs bark and all then it has it is uh, it is it, it is it means that there are some dogs which actually bark and all. So that leads to the existence of dogs dogs you know. So this leads to what we call it as some kind of conditional kind of validity you know. So depending upon whether or not S P M terms are empty or non empty uh, it is non empty then then only we can talk about validity of this syllogism. So suppose if they are empty in all like unicorns uh, etc goes goes etc and all uh, dinosaurs etc then Aristotle theory fails in all in this particular kind of case because it presupposes that all the terms that you are referring to in a syllogism are considered to be empty. So now uh, we look into uh, uh, the other aspect that is uh, this that uh, in the ancient past uh, in the, in the, during the Greek period, so they came up with uh, this particular kind of uh, uh, syllogistic poem, and with this poem they could identify what kind of syllogism uh, is considered to be valid with respect to what kind of figure and all. So quickly uh, uh, we can analyze this syllogistic poem in this way: all the vowels in a syllogistic poem corresponds to the moods, uh, 
and then uh, all the consonants etc are corresponding to uh, some kind of uh, operations that we can use uh, etc and all so that all the uh, uh, moves that occur in the uh, second third fourth figures can be reduced to the first figure and all. So in this class what we discussed is we presented some kind of rules of syllogism which makes uh, a particular kind of syllogism valid or invalid. So the rules are uh, uh, like this that uh, there are five rules which are followed out of that four are four rules are followed even in modern logics as well but only in the with respect to the fifth rule. So that is if you have two universal premises according to modern logic you need to have an universal proposition only if you say that if uh, if you infer a, ca a particular kind of proposition from two universal uh, propositions then it leads to some kind of fallacy there is a mistake in the argumentation because uh, we are importing existence in the conclusion which is not there in the premises that according to modern logic leads to a fallacy which is called as existential fallacy. So Aristotelian theory of syllogism more or less uh, works for uh, this 15 uh, both Aristotelian logic as well as the modern logic which followed after that one uh, works for this first 15 syllogisms which are considered to be unconditionally valid. So there are few problems with respect to Aristotelian theory of syllogism for example if you have more than three terms if there is a problem then if it is referring to some other kinds of propositions which are not in the standard format then also it presents some kind of problem. In the next class we will be analyzing the syllogistic poem and then we will talk about some of the important rules of uh, immediate inference such as conversion, aversion and contraposition rules which helps us in transforming from one categorical proposition into another one or it tells us how this A, E, I and O propositions are related to each other. So we will continue the same discussion in the next class.